know what direct action just did. They went into a farm and they only chose two piglets that right, right were particularly uh, particularly uh, cute. And I think the point was they were they felt they were rescuing them from particularly bad circumstances yeah, in the farm yeah. to make propaganda out of it, right? Mm-hmm. But I mean, if you believe in this, why didn't they burn down the farm? Why didn't they open all the cages? That's a common slogan. Why didn't they liberate all the pigs? Why did you just try to get, you know, f- why these two pigs? What's what's special about I think them? It's pretty obvious that it's for money. You know, it's trying to get money for the organization. By that, choosing these two piglets, you know, they're cute. You can watch their progress from, of course, when they first rescued right. them, they were right. on the verge of death. I think at least yeah, one yeah, of them sure, was. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, like updating people on their progress. And, right. Right. It's gonna get sympathy. It's gonna get attention. And, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, and it's and it's also yeah, in a way that's kind of also taking advantage of their lives. Sure. For their own benefit, you know. Like, of course, in a totally different way. It's not like DXC is going to slaughter the animals and make you you know make money off of their their flesh, right. but they're making money off of them in a different way. Yeah. Um, and I I don't think they they think about it in that way at all. Um, I think they think about it as justice. Um, Great. Yeah. Um. <laughs> we went to liberate the beagles from the laboratory. Suck the beagles free. We went to liberate the beagles from the laboratory. Suck the beagles free. Suck the beagles free. Suck the beagles free. Suck the beagles free from the laboratory. Suck the beagles free. Suck the beagles free. Suck the beagles free from the laboratory. We took them home in the back of our van. Six beagles, two were squatting Nottingham. When we got them there, there was something we had not realised. All the beagles were addicted to nicotine. They were used by the tobacco industry, you see. The beagles needed regals. We had a home was horrible rolling tobacco. <laughs> the beagles were not happy and they bit us on our knees. Bit us on our elbows and they gave us a disease. A disease from inside laboratories. A disease from inside laboratories. I'm in a case of football band. I'm in a case of football band. I'm in a case of football band. I'll never release any beagles again. <laughs>
A couple of years ago, I went down to spend the day beside this beautiful river in a really lovely part of the country. And it was a river which was meant to be thronging with life. There was meant to be water voles and salmon, kingfishers, and all these really amazing creatures. I couldn't wait, I was really excited. When we got to the river, it was dead. There was nothing in it except sewage fungus. That was the only living organism that I could see. Every other thing had been killed. I was just flabbergasted by this. This was meant to be a special nature site. And then I found this pipe just pouring filth into the river. And I followed it up to this dairy farm. That slurry, that cow shit, and filled up and was overtopping and it was just pouring straight into the river. And I thought, this is an environmental disaster area. So I phoned the pollution hotline run by our agency in Britain called the Environment Agency. It's a bit like the Environmental Protection Agency in the US. Two weeks later, I phoned them up again and said, so what have you done? Oh, we decided not to take any action, sir, because we don't think it's a serious pollution incident. I said, what do you mean it's not a serious pollution incident? It's wiped out the whole river. And they said, yes, sir, but we could find no evidence of a fish kill. I said, well, of course you couldn't find any evidence of a fish kill. There aren't any fish left to kill. And they said, well, thanks very much for your complaint, sir. Goodbye. Click. And then I got two whistleblowers, both writing to me and said, this is routine. We've been instructed from the top not to enforce against incidents like this, basically dairy pollution. But dairy farms is just wiping out rivers left, right and centre. And I thought, right, well, if they're not going to regulate this industry, I'm not going to buy its products. I don't want to be complicit in the destruction of these beautiful ecosystems. And I then started looking around the world and saw that the problem isn't just meat. The problem is dairy in a big way. The livestock industry is inherently no more sustainable than the fossil fuel industry. The footprint of the global transport sector is pretty well the same as the footprint of animal agriculture. The rate of soil loss is now so great that we have 60 years of harvest left. And a lot of that is driven by the need to grow huge amount of crops in order to feed the animals which we then eat. There's been a big drive to say, so what we need to do is to eat free range meat instead. And all you're doing there is swapping one crisis, which is an animal welfare crisis, for a different one, which is an environmental crisis. That free range beef and free range sheep is even more environmentally damaging than the indoor intensive production of meat, because it's fantastically inefficient. You often hear people tell you, well, it's our destiny to eat meat. Look at our teeth. You can see from our dentition that we've eaten meat in the past. And sure, of course, yeah, absolutely. And we've killed people in the past and we've set light to rainforests in the past and a load of horrendous things in the past. That doesn't mean we have to keep doing them. We have choice. We have free will. I think if you want to go vegan, the first step is to start eating some vegan food. <laughs> go to a kebab shop and get a falafel. It's good vegan food. Thai food, some Southeast Asian cooking, there's some really amazing vegan meals you can do that way. And it's weird how your mind changes to accommodate the decisions that you make. It's a funny quirk of being human. And then quite unconsciously, we sort of justify that even to the extent of our senses. The taste of cheese is no longer pleasant to me. This thing I used to love, I don't love it anymore. It just does nothing for me at all. It's just grease on the tongue. So what would the impact of stopping eating animal products be? Well, the first impact it means that we would use much less land than we currently use. A calculation suggests it would be between a third and a half of the land that we currently use. And the rest of that land, we can leave it to nature. We can allow nature to come back. It could be one of the very few ecological success stories anywhere in the world. We could see a great restoration, a great rewilding of nature. And that, to me, would be a wonderful thing. We can't detach ourselves anymore from the moral consequences of what we do. We can't say, oh, well, it's only me. What one person is doing is an aspect of what millions of people are doing, because we're all induced to do the similar sorts of things through market forces, through advertising, through marketing. So when you see those climate disasters, when you see people flooded out of their homes, when you see places turning into desert, when you see crops no longer being able to grow because it's too hot, when you see hurricanes intensifying and smashing everything up, 15% of that is because of what we're eating. Well, that alone is enough reason to change.